Hey, this is Jeff Gannon, and you're listening to the Gannon on Investing Podcast for Thursday, June 8th, 2006, recorded right here in beautiful northern New Jersey. As always, I'm looking for listener feedback, especially comments I can use in a future podcast. So if you've got something to say that's even remotely on topic, send an email to showmail at gannononinvesting.com or leave a voicemail at 1-800-782-1687. That's 782-1687. I received so many great emails during the time between new podcasts that I decided I'd have to devote an entire show to answering the most interesting ones. So that's all you're getting today, just one email after the next. You may remember I was supposed to discuss one of Peter Lynch's books today. Well, there's no chance of that happening because I simply have too many emails to go through. This episode will probably run very long as is. There's no way I'll be able to include the book segment and keep this thing to a manageable length. Therefore, I'm pushing it back one full week. From now on, Thursday will be the day I discuss books. I have a different segment planned for Tuesdays, so you'll have to wait a full week before you get to hear about Peter Lynch's book. Once again, I'm sorry for the schedule change, but I really need to keep these podcasts to a length you can digest in a single sitting. I've edited some of these emails for brevity and clarity. I didn't make any big changes, but you should know I did cut out parts that weren't really relevant. Not a big deal, but I might as well mention it up front. Okay, let's get to the emails. The first two questions come from Stephen. He asks about low price to book stocks. I just came across a small cap stock with a market cap of $78 million, which has zero debt, a price to sales ratio of 0.45, a price to book ratio of 1.06, and a current ratio over 4. The stock is Chromecraft Revington, ticker CRC. I don't know if it is unknown or unloved, as it seems that there are many institutional owners. The float is small at about 3.7 million shares, and there are 6.15 million shares outstanding. It seems to be a good company that has gone nowhere for the last few years. I don't know if it's on your radar, but thought it might be something that could be a podcast or post one day. First, let me thank Stephen for sending in this email. By the way, when he says it might be a post, he's referring to the fact that I also write a blog. I think most of you have already checked out my blog, but if you haven't, you can read it at gannononinvesting.com. Stephen writes his own blog, which can be found at valueblogreview.blogspot.com. Don't worry about remembering that address. I'll leave a link to Stephen's blog in the notes for this show. Now to the question. Chromecraft Revington designs, manufactures, and sells furniture to the residential and commercial market under five different brands. That's the blurb you'll see written just about any place online where you enter the ticker symbol CRC. The one important word in that can description is the word manufactures. Generally speaking, when we're looking for book value bargains, we don't like to see the word manufactures. We like to see words like designs, distributes, sells, and sources. Manufactures is something of a dirty word when hunting for book value bargains. There are a few reasons for this. First, there's the CapEx issue. Manufacturers have a lot of capital spending. They can put it off for a few years, but generally they need to do a lot just to maintain the current sales volume, because they compete largely on price. And they simply can't increase their sales volume much without a lot of capital spending, because they will eventually bump up against capacity problems. Human nature being what it is, we know that there will be a lot of explanations given for why new capital spending will prove profitable even if the facts don't support that conclusion. 
So there's always a temptation in a manufacturing business to reinvest retained earnings at very low rates of return and thereby destroy value. Now, the second and even more important problem with book value bargain manufacturers is that the book value is often much greater than the liquidation value. A retailer selling near book value may own a lot of real estate. A manufacturer almost never will. An asset light business selling near book value will usually have cash as a very large component of book value. A manufacturer will almost always have cash as only a small part of book value. Even the company's current assets will mostly be non-cash assets such as inventories and receivables. This is something you really have to watch out for. Inventory and receivables are the most dangerous forms of value investor bait. Well actually, real estate in a bad business may be the most dangerous form of bait, but these two are still pretty bad. Inventories and receivables are indeed both current assets. Theoretically, receivables will be converted into cash at a very, very high rate in the case of most liquidations. In other words, receivables are almost as good as cash most of the time. But here's the catch. There isn't going to be a liquidation. That fact changes everything. Cash can be removed from the business. Receivables can't be removed. I mean, they can in time. Obviously, if sales shrink, they can come out faster. But generally, you have to keep tying up some cash in the form of receivables as long as you keep selling your product. Obviously, this holds true for inventories as well. Both of these assets are necessary parts of doing business. They are part of what is producing the earnings each year. Chromecraft Revington has $17.5 million in total liabilities and a whopping $60.6 .6 million in current assets. That's a very strong balance sheet. Unfortunately, of that $60.6 .6 million in current assets, only $3.1 million is in the form of cash. So you can see how this kind of business can quickly become a value trap. The great looking $60.6 .6 million number lures you in. Pretty soon you find yourself knee deep in quicksand as quarter after quarter passes without much of a reduction in the working capital being tied up in the business. So you've bought a company for its assets, but then you find those assets are stuck in a mediocre business. So all you're getting is the returns they earn in that mediocre business, a business which usually isn't growing, and in this case, certainly isn't growing. Chromecraft's revenue has declined in each of the last five years. That's not a good sign. In fact, that's a big red flag waving for every investor to see. Now that we know we can't buy the company for its assets alone, we have to look to cash flow. Is the business generating enough free cash flow to justify our purchase price? First, the really good news, and I mean really, really good news. In each of the last 10 years, Chromecraft Revington's depreciation charges have exceeded capital expenditures. That's great news, because I can guarantee that's not what you'll normally find. Some companies do, in the aggregate, have higher depreciation charges than actual total capex spending. But very few have higher depreciation charges than capex year in and year out for a decade. And remember, Chromecraft Revington went 10 for 10 in this crucial area. So that fact is kind of a neat find. It's something that jumps out at you. That may not be the case for you now, but I can guarantee it will be once you spend some time looking at historical cash flow data. Pretty soon, a company that has depreciation charges higher than its capital spending for 10 straight years will look like a three-headed deer to you. I mean, it's quite odd, and it's actually a much better omen than a three-headed deer. Why is having depreciation charges higher than capital spending a good sign? Because it's a pleasant surprise. I know a lot of you have learned that everything begins and ends with the P.E. ratio, but that really isn't the case. Sometimes the P.E. ratio lies, not a lot, but enough to really screw anyone who makes big bets based solely on the P.E. ratio. 
Depreciation is the dirty little secret of gap accounting. All forms of accounting are focused on record keeping rather than analysis. A lot of people want accounting to do more than that. Basically, they want accountants to become analysts. Although there may be a market for that, I don't think turning accountants into analysts is a good idea. For starters, they'd make terrible analysts. The more raw the data, the better. You can work your way up from raw data. It's very hard to reverse engineer someone else's analysis to get to the data you need. Anyway, this little rant brings me to the issue of depreciation. We can agree on the value of the cash in a bank account. We can agree on the value of a quoted marketable security. We can even agree on the sale price of a corporate jet, even if we can't agree on whether that price was fair or not. But one thing we can't agree on is the useful life of an asset. I mean, determining the useful life of fresh flowers is pretty easy, but that isn't the kind of asset most corporations have on the books. They have things like jets, manufacturing equipment, etc. Even though I said we can't agree on the useful life of a jet, that's actually a lot easier than agreeing on the useful life of a more specialized asset. It's all very tricky, and for the most part, I think accountants actually do a fine job on depreciation. Combined with the required cash flow disclosures, there really isn't a problem in the United States with investors understanding depreciation charges, as long as they don't rely solely on the P.E. ratio. That's the key. There's a reason a statement of cash flows is included in the 10K, so use it. Looking at the historical cash flow data for Chromecraft Revington, we see that as expected, free cash flow has exceeded net income in most of the last 10 years. In some years, it hasn't. That might not make any sense to you right now, because it would seem that if depreciation is greater than CapEx, free cash flow should be greater than net income. That's often the case, but it's not always the case. Don't worry about that for now. Just look at the free cash flow data. Over the last 10 years, Chromecraft Revington has had average annual free cash flow of $13.4 million versus average annual earnings of $9.1 million. That's a huge difference and definitely something worth noting, but there's a catch. The two lowest annual free cash flow amounts were this year and last year, so free cash flow is shrinking, as is net income. Chromecraft Revington earned $7.3 million in 2005. With a market cap of $77 million, that gives the company a multiple of a little over 10 times last year's earnings. The free cash flow number wasn't great last year, but there's a complicating factor which I'll ignore for the sake of brevity and simplicity. This isn't an analysis of Chromecraft Revington, it's a discussion of book value bargains. So the important point, which is really little more than a rule of thumb, is that a company with no debt and annual free cash flow equal to at least 10% of its market cap is usually worth investigating. A company with annual free cash flow equal to less than 10% of its market cap isn't too appetizing purely as a cash cow you can milk. It needs something else. Maybe a lot of its assets are in cash, so the market cap conceals a much lower enterprise value. Or maybe earnings and free cash flow are at a cyclical low. Or maybe the business is growing. There are a lot of good reasons to buy a stock this cheap, but just milking it for cash is a questionable strategy in this particular case. If there was some catalyst that convinced you free cash flow was going to be put to a better use, this might be an interesting situation. But on balance, a cursory review of the stock leaves me lukewarm at best, which definitely equals a pass. When looking for book value bargains, you want to feel really good about the bargain you're getting. I hope that answers the question, even if only in an oblique manner. Finally, in case anyone is interested in researching this company further, I should add that there's been a rather large, frequent cash charge that you need to investigate. I didn't have time to look into the specifics surrounding the stock, because I wanted to talk about the general idea of seeking out book value bargains rather than the specific case. But that charge is something you need to investigate fully. If you check the past annual reports against the appropriate cash flow statements, it shouldn't be hard to find out what that charge is. Now on to Stephen's second question. So my question as a new investor 
is why do companies which have total cash per share of $3.15 and a book value of $9.63 per share sell for $4.64? I am talking about Avalon Holdings, ticker AWX. Do I look at it wrong by saying in theory that deducting the total cash per share from the stock price, you get a purchase price of $1.49 per share for an ongoing business and all its non-cash assets? In other words, can I subtract the cash per share from the book value and price per share to get book value of $6.50 and price of about $1.50, which would get me a price to book ratio of less than 0 0.25. In essence, am I really paying $0.25 cents for every hard dollar in assets? When I look at the annual and quarterly balance and see that net current assets are about $13.8 million, do I include the short-term investments of $4 million, and that total liabilities, both current and otherwise, are only $7 million? Am I wrong to think that these are good numbers? Assuming short-term investments are, in fact, part of current assets, I have $18 million in current assets, minus $7 million in total liabilities, for about $11 million in net current asset value, divided by $2 million share float, which gives me about $5.50 in net current assets against a selling price of $4.64 as of today, which is 81% of net current asset value. I have read Graham say that 66% is the magic number. Anyway, I just wanted to throw out another small cap. What are the dangers of looking at low price to book and low debt to equity stocks? Is it merely the underlying business risk involved? Okay. Let me start by answering Stephen's last question. The biggest danger of looking at a stock that has both a low price to book ratio and a low debt to equity is the underlying business risk. Mainly that the business will start hemorrhaging cash or already is hemorrhaging cash. In some cases there's the added risk that total liabilities as stated on the books are just plain wrong. This problem is most obvious in the case of insurance companies and defendants in major lawsuits. But it can also be an issue with retailers who lease their properties rather than own them, which is an awful lot of retailers. Therefore, low price to book retailers that are cash flow negative are particularly risky because the operating leases can really hurt when same store sales are headed in the wrong direction. Now that I've answered that question, we can get to Avalon Holdings, a company that is neither a retailer nor an insurance company. So the total liabilities as stated are probably as accurate as those of any other public corporation. Avalon's total liabilities are $7 million. Current assets are $18.3 million. Current liabilities are $6.7 million, which matches pretty closely the amount of current assets excluding cash and securities, which comes to $6.1 million. I know I just threw another new figure out there that doesn't appear on the balance sheet. But I hope it's pretty obvious what I mean by current assets, less cash and securities. In this case, it means the $5.6 million in receivables plus the $500,000 in other current assets. There's probably nothing mysterious about the $500,000 in other current assets. Despite the name, other current assets are perfectly normal things that I won't discuss here because they're boring, illiquid, and don't normally constitute much more than a prepaid expense of some kind. Economically, at least, you can think of most other current assets as a form of prepaid expenses. In some cases, an asset that's more than a prepaid expense gets lumped in under other current assets because of some accounting rule, but that's pretty rare. If the other current assets line is really big, you should look into it, but otherwise don't worry about it. The line should just be used to cancel out part of the current liability side of the balance sheet. The same is true of receivables. Use them to cancel out payables, and if there's anything left over, apply it to taxes payable and accrued liabilities. As far as the investor is concerned, short-term liabilities are really all the same thing. Unless you have a weird situation where a firm is on the brink of insolvency and some of that short-term debt is actually the current portion of long-term debt. But that's a totally different subject. So what does all this mean? It means that Stephen is right when he asks if he can use cash and short-term investments to cancel out all of the total liabilities and apply the remainder to the market cap. 
After doing that, you end up with roughly $7 million in enterprise value. According to Yahoo, Avalon's enterprise value is $6.17 million. It looks like we came to roughly the same conclusion, which suggests the method I just outlined is usually a perfectly good way of coming up with the enterprise value of a publicly traded company. Remember, the enterprise value could just as easily be called the enterprise price. Basically, it's the amount of cash an acquirer would have to shell out if he acquired every share of the stock at the last quoted price per share and eliminated all the company's debt. As usual, I've simplified matters a bit, but not in any way that does damage to the basic concept. Think of the enterprise value as the price you're paying for your share of the business, and you'll do just fine. The exception is in highly leveraged businesses that can handle the interest charges, but we aren't worrying about that right now. So we came up with an enterprise value of $7 million for Avalon Holdings. Yahoo says $6.17 million, but we'll just ignore them for now, because this way you can follow along with what I said earlier and arrive at the enterprise value of $7 million just using Morningstar.com, which happens to be my favorite investing website and one I highly recommend you go to whenever you want to look up a stock. I'm serious about this last part, and that's why I point you to Morningstar.com whenever I can. Okay, now let's get to the heart of the issue. What is Avalon Holdings worth? It has lost money in most years. Free cash flow was negative in most years as well. But there has been positive cash flow from operations, which is a start. Normally, all this would add up to a pass on Avalon at this point because it just looks too risky. But there's something interesting here. Often, property, plant, and equipment isn't worth anywhere near the amount on the books. But Avalon Holdings happens to be in a very interesting business. Actually, it's in a bunch of different businesses, but there's one particular line of business that includes a very interesting fixed asset. Avalon operates golf courses. Not only does Avalon operate the courses, it actually owns one of them. In Warren, Ohio, the company owns an 18-hole golf course located on approximately 200 acres. The company also owns some other properties, including a 37,000 square foot headquarters building, on 5.6 acres adjacent to the golf course, and a 48,000 square foot office building in another town in Ohio. The really interesting property is obviously the 200 acre golf course. I don't know anything about Warren, Ohio, so it would be impossibly difficult for me to value the golf course. I do know that if the golf course was located in North Jersey, I wouldn't be recording this podcast. I'd be gobbling up shares of Avalon Holdings as fast as I could, because I know a 200-acre golf course in North Jersey is worth a hell of a lot more than $7 million, which you'll remember is the price investors have to pay to acquire all of Avalon's non-cash assets, that is, the golf course, the headquarters, and the other office building. Despite not knowing anything about Warren, Ohio, there are a few things that interest me here. One. The town of Warren is in northeastern Ohio, which isn't the worst place to be in Ohio. It looks like it's within an hour and a half of Cleveland, but that's just a guess. It's also worth mentioning that there are other golf courses in Warren. Avalon's course isn't the only one. Other than that, I don't know anything about the town. I do know one other interesting fact, though. There seems to be a very good chance that the golf course is carried on the books at its 1990 price. That's a very interesting development, because while I may not know anything about Warren, Ohio, I do know something about inflation. So if the golf course is carried at the 1990 price, its actual dollar value is probably understated by a material amount, even if the real value of the land hasn't increased at all. And obviously, there's a decent chance the real value of the land has increased as well. In other words, Land prices in Warren, Ohio, may have appreciated faster than the rate of inflation over the last decade and a half. So what should you do about all this? I can promise you you're not going to like my answer. You're going to think I'm joking, but I'm not. This is a serious suggestion. If you're honestly interested in Avalon Holdings, if this kind of situation really appeals to you, there's only one good answer. The summer is coming. Most people take a little time off in the summer. 
How about spending a long weekend in Warren, Ohio? Once again, not kidding. I'm serious about this. First, check out the Morningstar data and then read the 10K and 10Q. Then, plan a little trip to Warren. Find yourself a hotel and make a note of all the different hotel prices because believe it or not, that will help you come up with a value for the golf course. While in Warren, you're going to collect whatever local papers you can find. You're also going to go everywhere those little real estate booklets are. If you're a really committed, sneaky, or nosy person, there are even better options available to you. Maybe you'll suddenly develop an interest in purchasing a home in Warren, Ohio. Maybe you'll ask the proprietor of a hotel about his business. And maybe, through some strange coincidence, property prices will come up. It's always possible. After all, that's a big expense for anyone running a hotel. All around you, there will be people who live in the area. Who knows all the possibilities that will present themselves? This is your chance to go out and get some real scuttlebutt. Now, all of this may sound ridiculous, but you have to remember, we're talking about a very small stock engaged in an obscure line of business, several obscure lines actually, in an obscure place in Ohio. If there's one place you're most likely to find an undervalued stock, it's Ohio. The potential upside here is huge. It's very likely almost no one has seriously considered this stock and taken the time to put a price tag on the land the company owns. Now, I don't know how much time and effort you're willing to put into one stock, although I'm guessing it's substantially less than a road trip to Warren, Ohio. But if this looks like a slam dunk, and once again, I have no idea if it does, because I don't know what 200 acres in Warren, Ohio is worth. But if it does look like a slam dunk after you've put in the legwork, you're going to be so sure of the situation, you'll feel comfortable putting a lot of money into it. After all, you're not really buying a business, you're buying a plot of land. You still want to make sure the business isn't going to consume a lot of cash. But as long as properties are worth several times the enterprise value of $7 million, you found yourself a solid investment. The intrinsic value of that investment will rise along with price appreciation in the local real estate market, and you'll have yourself a fine little investment. But if you're unwilling to drive out to Ohio and sacrifice the three days or so it'll take, you should just pass on the opportunity, unless you have another sure way of valuing the real estate because you're never going to have the confidence you need to hold this stock through tough times unless you put in the legwork. If, on the other hand, you do go and you find the golf course is worth much more than the market cap, you'll be more confident in this purchase than any other investment you've ever made. After all, you'll be buying a piece of the golf course for far less than it's worth, and you'll get a couple other properties and a rather weak operating business thrown in absolutely free. In both cases, I'm not willing to give you a definite answer as to whether you should buy or sell. Chromecraft Revington may work out fine, and Avalon Holdings may be a total dud. I don't know because I haven't done the homework. The situation at Avalon is more complicated than I made it sound, but the core premise is exactly as I presented it. You need to value the golf course against the enterprise value. That's the most important part of any investment decision involving Avalon Holdings. So like I said, if the idea of buying land for less than it's worth really appeals to you, do some reading and then plan a road trip to Warren, Ohio. I'd like to thank Stephen for letting me share both stocks with everyone. I haven't discussed specific stocks on the podcast for a while now, and I know some people want me to do it much more often. Okay, the next email question comes from David. He writes, I'm trying to learn how to value an insurance company. One of the stocks I'm trying to look at is Fairfax Financial Holdings, ticker FFH. To be honest with you, I'm not very good at valuing an insurance company. A lot of insurance companies have significant leverage, and I don't know how to judge whether they reserve properly or not. About FFH, I understand it is selling way below book value, but financially it is very leveraged. It has also been selling huge amounts of its own stock over the last two years. Having said that, there are many great investors that invest heavily in FFH. If you have some time, I would be grateful if you would give me some advice on how to value an insurance company. First, let me say this is a really great question. 
It's a subject I should have discussed earlier because it's so important and so practical. How do you value an insurance company? It's a pretty simple question, but there's no simple answer. I wish I could tell you that I have some great insight into how to value an insurance company, but I don't. It's one of those areas, like Big Pharma, that I just can't evaluate based on the financials alone or on any metrics derived from those financials, at least in many situations. However, I have invested in insurance companies, particularly very small insurance companies, selling at, near, or below book. As I mentioned in one of my podcasts, there are really two reasons for a value stock being offered. There's contempt and there's neglect. In some businesses, not many, but a few, I can buy into a situation where there's contempt because I understand the competitive position of the business. If Wall Street decides spices are a bad business and shares of McCormick drop to 75% tomorrow, I would know enough about the economics of the industry in general and the competitive position of McCormick in particular to know I could safely buy in at those prices, so I'd be gobbling up shares without a moment's hesitation. I know McCormick and I know when it's cheap. There's no tough call to make. That isn't the case with insurance companies because of the reserves issue. Large insurance companies tend to be cheap for a reason. More importantly, they also tend to be a bit more complex. For instance, I can look at AIG, but if I do, I have to think about several different businesses. Just like banks, I found that buying small, cheap insurance companies is the best bet. In those cases, I look for a history of good returns on equity and assets, a business I can understand better than most, a history of not severely diluting shares, and a strong relationship between total investments and total stated liabilities. The last one is obviously a downside protection. If reserves are way off, you'll have problems no matter what. But if you start with a small, fairly simple insurance company that has a lot of investments relative to the stated liabilities, reserves have to be very wrong to actually destroy your investment. As I see it, there are a few obstacles to my understanding Fairfax. The first is reinsurance. It's always harder for me to value any reinsurer because losses are a normal part of the business. That is to say that some excellent reinsurers lose money in some years, but both make money in the aggregate and make sure losses during any one year will not threaten the firm's capacity to pay. But how can I know if management has in fact made sure that such catastrophic losses will not occur? It's the same problem you have with some banks, except it's magnified greatly. I can understand some loan portfolios, but not most from the disclosure given. For instance, I understand Valley National Bank Corps well enough to feel pretty secure about their loans, even in the worst circumstances. But that's a very special case. The situation at a reinsurer is similar in that there is a real lack of transparency, which is not the insurer's fault, it's just a consequence of the opaque nature of the insurance business. However, the consequences of this lack of transparency are greater in the case of an insurer, especially a reinsurer, than they are at any bank. Finally, you also have the problem of acquisitions. Fairfax has bought other insurers, usually at cheap prices. These situations are impossibly difficult to understand at first, and only years later do you begin to see the full consequences of those purchases. You either have to trust management's take on these things, the runoffs and such, which is always hard to do, or you have to file the stock under too hard. That is, you simply have to withhold judgment and move on to analyzing other opportunities. The best I can do is offer a few general pieces of advice that seem to work well. As I said, I think your time is best spent focusing on smaller players who aren't involved in reinsurance. The smaller the company, the better, and you don't want to see a lot of analysts covering the company. No analyst coverage at all is a great sign. You want to look for neglect rather than contempt. My next piece of advice is to look for specialty insurers, especially ones focused on an identifiable niche. There are a lot of niches in the insurance business. Most aren't going to do you a lot of good, but if you have a real focus in terms of the risks you write, the customers you serve, and the geographic area in which you operate, that certainly doesn't hurt. You can find companies like that where management has a big stake in the business. While I don't think anyone is managing a company with the intent of running it into the ground, I certainly don't mind having the manager own a lot of the company as well. 
The best situation, of course, is for the company to be essentially a family business. Some people see the potential for conflicts of interest there. All I see is a more risk-averse management team. Finally, you have the financial strength ratings issued by AM Best. That's additional information you have in the insurance business that simply isn't available on small companies in other industries. A really small business isn't going to have its debt rated, so you won't have an independent financial strength rating. When it comes to small insurers, you will have that extra bit of information, which can act as a sort of check against your own analysis. If everything else checks out well, and the financial strength rating is both strong, let's say A- minus or better, and in agreement with your own take on the company, then provided the investment is made at a reasonable price, which probably means somewhere close to book value, you should feel pretty comfortable buying the stock, despite your belief that you simply aren't very good at valuing insurance companies. The most important thing is simply to stick to the margin of safety concept. Ask how much reserves have to be off by to cause you to lose your initial investment. How large a hit to net worth can the stock endure? You can do this by first estimating an appropriate price to book value ratio, comparing it to the actual price to book ratio the stock is trading at, and then determining how much liabilities would have to increase by to cause the intrinsic value to fall below your purchase price. Well, that's the best I can offer. I hope it helps. Okay. Now for the last question. Mike from California writes, I've recently discovered your podcast and now your website. I find it very interesting and informative. I'm almost done with your current list of shows and I'm hoping you're going to keep up with them. I enjoyed your book analysis segment, stock of the week picks, and overall informative format. I always thought it would be interesting to feature one common ratio, percentage, or other key statistic and what it could mean for each business you look at. For instance, you could feature P ratios, how they vary by sector, and how they relate to the earnings yield. You could also do a segment on price to book ratios, profit margins, and so on. When I first started investing, it was hard to learn what these things meant, and doing this may open your show up to a larger audience. Well, Mike, I like this suggestion so much I decided to add just such a segment starting next week. I'll talk about P ratios on next Tuesday's podcast. Until then, happy hunting.